I'm here with Grandmaster Vinay Bhatt. Hello, Vinay. Hey, Sagar. How are you doing? I'm I'm doing very well. It's early in the morning here in India, uh, but I'm very happy to be doing this with you because I have your book with you, and it says very simply how I became a chess grandmaster, and there is no one better than me because you know I'm an IM. I have two GM norms. <laughs> and and the title of hey, the book okay. is like how I became a chess grandmaster and this is something that I would love to know. Uh, congratulations on writing this book. Thank you, thank you. And it's written for Quality Chess, which is one of my uh, favorite publishers. Uh, how how did this come about? Uh, and and if I'm not mistaken, you stopped playing competitive chess in 2014. So it's been nine years since then, uh, and you decided to write this book. Yeah, no, it's um, actually, it wasn't when I started writing in 2021, actually, it wasn't um, something I, I really thought would be a, uh, I wasn't sure it would be a formal chess book. Um, like the fact it was published by Quality Chess is like, I'm really honored by that, actually, because when I started writing, I was writing really for myself. And um, I think I wanted to make a little bit of sense of like my chess career. Uh, and I, I actually fiddled with a bunch of different ideas. Um, like initially, I think uh, I used to blog regularly. Uh, so I actually, I think, wrote like blogs for maybe six, seven years. I wrote some articles for chess.com. Uh, and I had some ideas, like most of the ideas were related to like almost like a chapter title or a section title. And then I would fit games to that idea. And then um, I was looking at some of them and I, I shared them with a couple of chess friends and uh, real, like, actually, I think some of them were interesting, but some of them were also like, I wasn't really adding anything new in a way. Mm. Um, and I realized actually like my own story informed part of, um, you know, like my chess journey. I think you were saying earlier that like our play reflects a little bit of our inner like self in a way. Um, and I realized actually that was probably a more interesting angle of it, of like, why did I learn the way I did or why did I study the things I did? Um, and so actually there's like, there. I think my first sort of idea, I had so many other chapters that like were really just like, uh, I don't think they really would have added much into like the chess literature kind of world. Mm. Um, and so I felt like actually my story would be interesting to people specifically um, people who are like, it's not necessary for beginners, people who don't know how to play or learning how to play. It's really meant for um, tournament players who are, especially who've been stuck at a level for a little while. Because um, when I started writing this, I like, I remembered I got stuck at 2,400 for two years. I got stuck at 2,450 again. Uh, and then I got stuck at about 2,550. Uh, but when I was writing this, I realized I actually got stuck at 2,200 as well for two years. Wow. And I I didn't remember that actually. <laughs> um, I, I Part of it was like, I love chess. So like, even if I haven't been playing since 2014, it's um, like once a chess player, always a chess player kind of thing. Uh, and so... Uh, looking back, it was sort of like, oh, how did I get stuck at these different levels? How did I make progress afterwards? And um, that became sort of the the story, the narrative throughout. Um, right. And so that's why that that's what ended up being sort of the final product. Um, and I, honestly, like uh, I was I took some time off in between jobs uh, and I started writing. Um, and then my first week at my current job, uh, I had just sent out a draft to a few publishers and uh, Jakob Agard at Quality Chess got back to me and he said, hey, we're interested. Mm. Um, and in my head, I was like, oh, man, like <laughs> I just started a full time job. <laughs> so I I wasn't actually sure I, I had um, I had actually done all this layout work because I, I didn't think anybody would be interested in it. Right. Uh, and so I. I had laid it out myself because I thought, okay, I've done all the work or I have some ideas. Let me self-publish. I'll share it with friends and family. We'll be done. Um, but then he said he was interested and that meant there was a lot more work to do. <laughs> I, 
I mean, you had already written the entire book, right? So after he he said that it's interesting. Did you have to go back over and uh, correct stuff? And how how was that? Oh, I think that that process was um, there was a lot of stuff that I had written already, but some of it was jumbled up. Some of it was like not well organized. Um, and he's he's got like a good eye for those kinds of things. Um, and so he had a bunch of suggestions. He had some things that he really wanted me to change. And then he had other suggestions that as I tested them out, I realized I liked his suggestions more than my original. Mm. Um, and slowly, actually, I ended up, I think I made, call it like 99% of the changes he was suggesting. Wow. Uh, and he was suggesting things around like the structure, um, how to try and describe some of the games where to put sort of key diagrams, things like that. So there's a lot of, um, some of it was organization. Basically the second half of the book, or maybe the uh, the last one third of the book, uh, all the organization changed actually. Mm. Um, basically once I achieved the GM title, that's where th like the organization changed. The rest of the book stayed a lot more structurally similar. Um, but realistically, I think I was also... Uh, I was also pretty slow in making my edits. Hmm. Um, and so it took more than a year actually before I turned it around. I, I had set, I, I was in India in December of uh, 2022 and I had set myself like hard deadline. I need to get this done before I fly. Um, and I, I did, I like, I beat my deadline by two two weeks, but um, at the same time, I think Jakob probably was hoping for it like six months earlier, probably. <laughs> Well, that's what happens when you write such a book. Uh, if I if I can show the people the cover of the book here, uh, it is uh, this way, how I became a chess grandmaster. And, and the cover is interesting because it shows you, I think uh, you you are in your 20s on the on the right yep. side. And in the background, you are there's a picture of you. Uh, I guess that's when you were in your teens. Uh, yeah, actually, even younger. I think I was um, nine or ten in that photo. Oh, yeah, and and it it just shows that this is your journey, right? In chess, yep. from being a young kid to becoming a full fledged grandmaster. No, that's right. Um, and I, that's like the start of the book is uh, like the introduction. Actually, I got a chance to play David Bronstein. Yes. Um, and and like Magnus Carlsen. These two. Magnus games. Carlsen. Uh, and so that that those are the first two games in the introduction to say like, okay, when I played Bronstein, um, it was a blitz game. I was 1800. Uh, he naturally beat me. Like, uh, And then when I was already a GM, I played Magnus Carlsen just after he won his first world championship match. So in Chennai, uh, he was visiting the Bay Area afterwards. We played a blitz game. And so like the book basically says okay, how did I go from playing one to the other mm -hmm. in a way? Um, how did I get those chances? And like, I lost both games. That's okay. Uh, yeah, that's like were, part of being almost, a chess player. Almost so. going to beat Magnus. I, uh, I, I think um, it, was, it was funny because afterwards, like as soon as we looked at the game within seconds, like I realized how I could have won that end game. Um, but in the moment, for sure, it's tough. And like, I, you, you know, it's like every you're playing those kinds of games and like you have some regrets of like, Oh man, I could have been Magnus in a blitz game, but it's okay. Like realistically I, I would have kept my day job. So <laughs> that's true. Well, uh, this is the way in which you have kind of arranged the chapters in your book. Um, I realized that you were a big talent. You became the youngest national master in the U S so that's kind of the first couple of chapters. And then, Yep. Uh, you talk about how you got stagnated for, as you said, for a couple of years, then you had to change your coach, uh, then you sort of improved, then uh, there, there are chapters like adventures with the King's Indian attack, then the Bishop B5 Sicilian becoming an IM. Uh, I think you became an IM at the age of 16. And then you took a break from chess. Suddenly, yeah, you, did, you were not playing chess. And then again, you started fighting for the GM title. There's something called sharpening my style where you kind of uh, start playing in different ways. And I see that there's a, a nice balance of chess uh, chapters. Like, as you said, King's Indian Attack, Bishop B5 mm -hmm. Sicilian, IQP, 
there's also things like changing in style, sharpening your chess, chess for pythons and so on. So just this is your story plus yep. these are the chapters. How should someone go through these these chapters if they are if they are looking at it should they go through it like a story and then go through it or they could pick up any chapter and go through your games i, I think you can do it either way um the story like the book is presented largely chronologically so the first few chapters like you said i'm um i'm a kid who's uh first basically three chapters are all me being 2200 then it's like 2200 to the I am title in chapters four through call it eight. Um, and then it's getting stuck there at the 2400 level for a while before my first GM norm and then so on. Mm. Um, but you can pick up in a lot of places. Uh, I think sometimes the stories may make more sense of like, uh, oh, like why was I referencing something I did as a kid and like right. I changed my approach. Uh, but the games themselves are all standalone. Uh, typically I would say the games, like both me and my opponents are probably a little bit lower rated in the first few chapters. And then it, uh, by chapter 21 or so, it's like, I'm playing guys like Tivyakov and so on in, in more of the games. It's I think 2021 or generally more 2,600, sometimes 2,700 grandmasters. So, um, but you can, you can pick up anywhere and it's really meant for, I think people who are, uh, in in, in my view, it's maybe 2000 on up, 1800 on up who are stuck at a level for a little bit and want to figure out how they might get better. Mm. Um, and then for me, I think, uh, like, I don't know that I'm going to be anybody's favorite player, but like often it's like you find some a chess player whose style you resonate with in some way, whose games interest you. Um, so for me, like there, there've been a couple, like couple players in history that like whose games I'll always be interested in looking at. Um, and so maybe somebody finds that interesting, maybe somebody who's a junior player, who's trying to balance school and chess, mm. they may find some of, uh, um, academic pressure in India is like also often pretty big. Yes. Uh, and so like, there's a competition for university and so on. So it's like, how do you try and balance some of those things? I, I think it happened with you as well, right? Because you were very talented. Uh, you were doing well in chess, but then you gave it up, uh, because of academ uh, academics, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Basically, um, I always loved playing chess, but my parents never really forced me to play or pushed me to play. And so um, go going to like university, getting a degree was kind of always part of their plan for me as well. Um, and so I actually didn't even I didn't even think twice about it in that sense. Um, I also like by the end of high school, I was like quite good. At, I was an international master. But like yes. if you're talking about a world stage, that's not like um maybe not so impressive and especially now i feel like uh you got india has enough gms who are under 18 already that like it's uh definitely not a big deal true true but but you were uh, a very big talent right and you as you mentioned you beat the record of bobby fisher by a long margin of course different eras but i think yep. that was yep. a sign of what was there in you as a talent uh maybe at that point it just wasn't taken as seriously as it is taken mm -hmm. now. Yes. No, for sure. I think um, even in the U S like trying to get some sponsorship uh, like that was very difficult to come by. Now I feel like it's a little bit more common. Um, certainly in India, it's become more common. Um, I think even when I was playing professionally, call it 2008, 2009, there are a lot of uh, either banks or railways, uh, you know, like, consulting firms, oil and gas ones that are like sponsoring chess players. Um, but call it in the mid nineties, late nineties, that wasn't really the case. Um, and so th it, it wasn't something I, I had in mind initially. I think also like as much as I love chess, I also did enjoy doing some other stuff too. And so that, that became, it's, it wasn't like my only hobby or focus. And so that made it easier than to almost step away for a little bit. Um, cause I, I didn't feel like I was bored, um, with like, say other subjects or doing anything else. Right. You, you were good at other things as well. So, so chess was not the only option for you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, so, so, uh, you, you, what's your Indian connection? 
were you born in india or you were born in the us uh, i i guess your parents are from india which which part of the country yeah for sure so i was born in the us i was born in san jose uh, california uh, both my parents are from uh, like south india so my mom uh, grew up in mudikeri so um, hill station area near mysore in karnataka state uh, my dad grew up in a small village called yetarka um it's near mangalore kasargod district in kerala um but uh both of them are basically uh haviyaka kanadigas um karnataka state so uh they are the only people they're like it's a big family um they both have seven or eight siblings each um and everybody and their kids are basically in india still so um So I I come to India probably every 2 years right now. Mm. Uh visit family, visit relatives um because everybody else is there. Wow, amazing. And and when you went to the the college, uh what did you study uh, in the university? I studied uh statistics and then I studied also political economy, so a combination of political science and economics. Um and so I I graduated with two bachelor's degrees and then I I after so Interestingly after leaving chess I got into data science and machine learning stuff and I so I went back to school to take some graduate courses in those fields. I don't have a full on uh, PhD or anything but um I did take a number of classes in that in that I think one thing which becomes very apparent from whatever you say in your chess or life otherwise is that you've constantly been analyzing your style the way you do things the way you play and I think that makes it very interesting uh, in the book as well because you're constantly saying this is what i was not doing well this is yep. what i should improve and then you would implement new things which would work not work i guess that's been the trend of of your life in general no for sure actually i think um i don't know that i started with that habit but um one of my early chess coaches he wanted me to start analyzing my own games mm-hmm. so like i think it's a common common advice for young students of hey look at your own games even if the annotations aren't necessarily correct you get in the habit of doing that um and so i developed that habit and actually really enjoyed doing that that was part of how i started writing the book mm. is that um so like i i i lead teams now in data science and machine learning and people were asking me for like career development how should i get better and so i i wanted to put together something like um almost like either a study plan or like what is the rubric mm. for like what's different skills you can have in data science um and that actually so like one of the first chapters i wrote was actually chapter 3 in the book where it has no chess but it's diagnosing it's i think it's called postmortem basically lessons yes. and it diagnoses why i got stuck the first time mm-hmm. and it tries to present uh like a map or like a you know a bunch of different areas in chess that you can study and what i noticed in the workspace is that a lot of people they focus on like building up the same skill and they get better and better in that one skill um and that's what i actually tried to do with chess myself whereas in chess like people can expose your weaknesses a lot more and so like one of the things i had to learn very early on was that um i think the way i fra- frame it is like you're only as strong as your weakest link Mm. whereas before i used to do i i used to study capablanca games i used to do the same kinds of tactical puzzles and i was like if i can get to basically if i if i just keep studying these same things i'll just get better and better and a lot of people in the workplace do that um and that works but that's actually where one of the first ideas for the book came from that of like um i try to do a better job now of like looking back on sort of Hey, what was the last year like? What did I learn? What could I have done better? Um and I decided to do that on the chess front. Uh and that's where sort of some stuff started coming together. Wow. That's amazing. And I think uh becoming a GM when you are in your 20s is more difficult than when you are in this flow, right? When you were 16 and an IM yeah. maybe becoming a GM by 18 would have been quite okay. I mean, it's a normal story. Not normal, it's a great story, but you know <laughs> taking a break and then again reconnecting with your style as you said you started changing your openings your style of yep. play yeah and actually like the break uh, 
it like it almost didn't happen in a way because um so when I went to university I didn't play for my first two years and then I played one tournament um I played the U.S. Junior Championship because the U.S. Junior Championship is under 21 uh and so like it was my last year of eligibility at the time um sorry it's under 20 it was my last year of eligibility and um I figured hey like let me go and play. I was going to be the number two seed, even though I hadn't played in years. And the first few games went well, but then like I lost all the last like four games in a row in like terrible style, progressively worse and worse. Where like if I think if you look at my like game in the ninth round, you'd be like, okay, this guy might be like 1400. Maybe, maybe that's even generous, right? Like some 1400 might get offended that like, no, no, no I, I would play better than this for sure. Um, I think I lost in 15 moves uh, and it, it wasn't even like a fight. Um, mm. And so I, I had that loss, like those losses. And I said, Hey, like I'm in school, like I can just keep studying. I'll go work a normal job. Uh, and then some longtime chess friends, David Proust, Andy Lee, they kind of convinced me to join with them to found a chess center here, uh, East Bay chess. It's no longer around, uh, but um, we started putting it together when I was in college and David had just graduated. Um, and that was a little bit of my reintroduction into chess. Mm. Uh, and I think actually I, I started to enjoy things again a little bit more after that, like the chess playing, because, you know, it's frustrating when you lose yeah. um, and it's frustrating when you lose repeatedly. Uh -huh. And so I think that helped me get back into it, but it, yeah, I think, um, so I, I think I actually, I got the IM title just before I turned 16, but then I got the GM title at 24, I think. Right. So like there's a long way in between and um, some of those years I was playing somewhat regularly too. And so like it, it was, I was stuck again in multiple ways. Uh, so I changed up all my openings. Uh, basically I said, okay, like um, whatever I used to be doing wasn't working. So like, I'll play D4 for the first time. It's okay if I don't know any theory, I'll just play D4. Yeah, right. um, wow. And so all my openings changed. And that actually, I think because I enjoyed playing again, I got new positions. I didn't have to worry about like, I was doing okay enough that I didn't need to worry about theory too much. Mm. That re-sparked the joy in playing. And then that helped trigger, like, if you're not enjoying it, it's hard to make progress. Um, but that that interest then sort of enabled the future progress. Right. And I think uh, when you became a GM also uh, at, at 24, you already have done your uh, university, you are graduated, uh, you are now a GM. I think you also managed to reach 25, 50. Did you ever have yep. this confusion that uh, whether I should go make chess my full time thing or, or do something else? Uh, no, actually, for sure. There was, um, like I debated it. Uh, I talk about it a little bit in the book. It was like, it was a pretty stressful decision for me to like um, leave chess and give like a nor like call it a desk job, like a normal uh, like a yeah. a normal job a chance. Um, I actually wasn't sure when I came back to to go work. I wasn't sure that I would end up enjoying it because mm. um, I'd worked before and I didn't enjoy that the first job I did. Like I found it extremely boring and that's part of the reason I went to left to go play chess um and so I wasn't sure but I wanted to give it a shot because I was I was stuck at 2550 for a little bit uh like you said and I was like well let me see if changing it up maybe I'll you know maybe I'll find something interesting and if it's not then hey I can come back and play chess there were some people um who uh there was a Canadian grandmaster I remember talking to Kevin Spraggett who was like, hey, you're, I think at the time I was like maybe 250, number 250 in the world or 220, something like that. And he was like, do you really think you can be number 220 in whatever like industry job you end up working? And I was like, I have no idea. But like for him, that was like, you should do whatever you're best at. Mm. Um, so I think he was advising maybe don't do it. I think Yuri Shulman, for example, another grandmaster was like, yeah, like chess is really tough. Uh, unless you want to like start coaching and uh, doing camps on the side, like um, maybe go explore this other option. Uh, there are actually some players in India who asked like, hey, maybe you can get like a, you know, like a PIO or something like that. And then you can get sponsored by one of the Indian companies. Like, 
I don't know, right? It was like uh, Barth Petroleum or right. Railways or various other people may give like sponsorship at that point. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. Um, so I had like, I had various ideas in mind. Uh, I would say that like, I was, I, I wasn't necessarily happy when I decided to leave chess mm. um, because like, it, it was hard to like let go in a way. Right. At the same time, I recognized that, hey, like, I'm not going to be world champion. Um, and so like, let me go see if, uh, I have other interests, maybe this will work out. And it ended up being that like, yeah, like I found a job or in an industry that I really enjoy. And mm -hmm. so it's been, it scratches that mental itch of like problem solving that you have to do at the board, all of those things. And so it's like, oh, okay, yeah, I, I can do this. So, so, so chess, what you learned there is also helping you in your work right now. I think so. Mm -hmm. Um, in a couple ways. So like, um, there's definitely things like patience and concentration focus that like you need for a lot of industry jobs of like, you have to, you have maybe have many meetings or projects go on for a while. Um, but there's also, uh, like in chess, there've been these studies with, uh, lower rated players and higher rated players. And often what happens is that the higher rated player actually considers fewer kind of moves. Mm right? They don't consider all the legal moves in a position. Uh, one thing I've noticed is like, partly it's through that habit of like analyzing your own decisions. Like I've gotten better in data science and machine learning for sure. Uh, but I also, I, I feel like I actually uh, like arrive at the most likely solution or like what's the most, what's the fastest way that we can get a good answer here or a good model, good algorithm. I tend to consider fewer options, I feel like, than a lot of my colleagues. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, and it's it means that often like I can coach them through like, hey, why why might options B and C here be less likely to succeed? Mm. Um, but I think there's some stuff there that like uh that I I've like through self-reflection, I've gotten better on like the data science machine learning side. And as a result, actually the prioritization at work is like it's weird because at work, everywhere I've worked, people think I'm really good with time management and I'm very good at like prioritization because I seem to pick out like the likely causes more quickly. I recognize those patterns, things like that. Um, but then at the chessboard, everyone knows, like everyone who's played me basically knows that like I'm a time trouble addict. So like, yeah. Maybe that's something you learned from chess, what not to do and that. that no, uh, yeah, there, there was this, um, there's actually this like famous old book, I feel like, uh, maybe not so famous, but like it was like How Not to Play Chess by a Soviet grandmaster, I think. And I remember I saw that book once as a kid and was like really intrigued of like, oh, this is like, you can learn from the, like, from the bad stuff too. So. Right. But, but does it ever happen that chess is such a... Uh sport you are so self-obsessed right you're all the time thinking about yourself your improvement what can you do better and then when you are in this workspace uh, interacting with so many people uh, does that ever happen that you're like now you have to think about others as well and and that's not no, I, for chess players that i i think you're spot on actually that is like a real challenge um i think it's I think I've gotten better at it because like chess is really solitary, right? Um, you don't talk to the other person. There's no like collaboration. There is some stuff that you can do like studying wise, which really helps. But um, I think it is like, it is an adjustment. I think part of the benefit I had is that like, I went through sort of the public schools here. I went to university. So I had some sort of background in some of that already. It wasn't like totally new. Um but yeah, I think there's there's definitely something of like uh, where chess is so like, you know, one on one, right? It's like, um, it's almost like in tennis, you have singles, but you also have doubles, right? Like chess has nothing really like that. And so like, uh, yeah, I think it I think it becomes tough. Like, um, you're not supposed to talk to your opponent, the person you're like, maybe sitting from for like four hours for like one game, right? You like, you never exchange, you're not supposed to talk to them. So. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I do struggle sometimes with that in my work. Uh, but when I, uh, how about looking at some chess uh, and maybe a couple of your fine games? Uh, I, I 
try to look at them in the book as well. If we could go over them. Uh, yeah, perfect. Yeah, I'd be happy to. So this one is against uh, GM Granda uh, Zuniga. And he is kind of an amazing player. He's 26-34 here, but I believe his highest rating, peak rating was close to 2700. Uh, yep. Very strong GM. And this was in 2006. Uh, what was your strength back then? I was an IM, um, and I was actually, uh, this was just after I graduated from university, and I decided to travel in Europe for a couple months before starting my uh, full-time career in, like, economic consulting. Mm. Um, and so I, like, I played a couple open tournaments. They had GM norm opportunities. Uh, but I think my rating probably accurately reflected my strength. But then uh, during those summer tournaments, that's when I started to like I, I gained a lot of points that summer actually. Um, and yeah, this was, this was definitely one of the the highlight tournaments. This is where I got like my second GM norm. This is the Balaguer open. Uh, yep. And yeah. And you, you beat him in just 20 moves. So I'm very interested to see, uh, knight f3, bishop b4 mm -hmm. check, the Bogo Indian. Yep. When knight d2, castles a3. And you went for the, the sharp line here. As you said, you were an e4 player, but you started playing d4 at some point. Yeah, I started playing d4 uh, basically a year before this game. Um, and it's all because I, uh, like I said, I, I played at the US Junior and I'd done terribly. I finished in last place uh, and I decided, okay, I just need a change. So um, I was invited to play one tournament as like an IM. It was an IM norm tournament. Uh, and I said, okay, I'll play and I'm going to do, I'm going to play all, basically all the opposite openings of what I normally would do. So oh, I played like D4 as white. I used to play like the semi-slav as black and I was playing things like the Benoni, mm. like totally different openings. Um, and that's how I started playing D4. But and with, when I played was it D4, with preparation or you just went out there and? Uh, not much actually. So um, when I played D4 this summer... Uh, I was actually playing the Trumpowski. Mm. Uh, D4, knight f6, bishop g5 every game. And I, I'd beaten some like 2,600 GMs with that. Uh, but then just before this game, I had lost to um, uh, one uh, Grandmaster, uh, Josep Ohms Police. Mm. And because of that, I was like, okay, I need to play something somewhat normal. Um and the thing about Granda is that he plays all the openings. And so I, I didn't actually guess right on like what he would play. Um, so at this point, I was already just like, okay, just play some chess. Uh, let's see. Yeah. This is my first game ever in a Bogo Indian, actually. Oh. And you went for the sharpest line uh, here. Sometimes ignorance is bliss. So, <laughs> but, but I think this move 94 is not the best, right? Uh, I think knight F D seven. Uh, yeah, for sure. Before. And, I think one thing that was I was interested, like I put it in the notes, but he had actually played this before from the white side. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, and he'd faced knight fd7. So for whatever reason, he chose to play knight e4, but basically trading the knights here helps white um, a little bit more. It just makes it harder for him to develop with c5. Right. So bishop d2, he took here, mm -hmm. bishop takes, and b6. And you brought your queen out, bishop b7, and you just castled. I mean, your position definitely looks more comfortable. You have more space. Uh, yep. But but it's not like anything terrible for black. Yeah. He if he if he goes for c5 here, still quite okay. It's, I think it's still quite playable. Um, I think what he was worried about with c5 is like I play rook f d1, um, and. Even if he takes his pawn on d4, he's not he's not going to be able to hold it. Mm. And his concern then is like, where does he put his queen? Um, like once the center files open up, yeah. uh, one rook on d1, one rook on c1, basically, and it's not obvious where he'll find a safe spot. Mm. Um, and so he got a little concerned by this, and he played. Uh, he got a little too creative. I would a5. say. A5. Yeah, he played yeah. a5. Maybe he wants to exchange with uh, bishop a6 yeah. perhaps yeah so you went rook c1 
-hmm. But now he cannot do this or maybe this he is... He can still do it. It's just, um, let's say he trades on C4, queen takes C4. Uh, so I, I can play in this position, maybe rook FD1 or bishop B3. Mm -hmm. And basically then he's got, um, he still has trouble bringing that C5 pawn forward, right? right. He can't play C5 so easily. Uh, he can't guard the pawn. Um, I mean, he has to play rook a7 or something to guard the pawn. Yeah. And if he plays c6, he can never develop the knight from b8, right? So it's still awkward. Mm. It's not the it's not the end of the game for sure. But um, yeah, I, I think he. It, it's like white's clearly better, and it's now a question of okay, how do I improve? So maybe um, maybe I start playing for something like h4 and uh, piece on g5, g3, h4, put a piece on g5, something like that. Got it. So in the game, he went rook a7, trying to defend yep. the c7 pawn. You brought your other rook into the game. Very logical. Knight a6. Mm -hmm. And now just bishop e3 against c5. Uh, he went queen a8. So this is very uh, creative. Yeah. Uh, like the red t, sometimes you go rook a2. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Queen yeah. A1. Yep. Uh, he's done this. But now you played your knight back to e1. Rook d8 and queen g4. Did you did you already start feeling like okay, this game is going to go my way here? I felt pretty good here for sure. I think um like all my moves so far have been pretty logical. Like the big thing with knight e1 was that hey, he's abandoned the king side, so let me start moving in that direction. Mm. Um and so at this point I didn't I didn't I had not expected his move. Yes. Um, knight his B8. next move, I think you pre yeah previewed it. Knight b eight, which okay, he's uh he realizes something's gone wrong on the queen side, and he's hoping because uh he couldn't play c five there anyway. Mm. Um, White has ideas of either uh, taking on e six or bishop h six. Sometimes uh, there's also like a clear win of a pawn here. I can take on a six and take c five. So like there's many choices for for White to like come out ahead. Right. Um, but he's hoping at this point, okay, like maybe I can, um, the other thing knight b8 prepares is bishop d5. So if he plays bishop d5 right away, I can take on a6, rook a6, and rook c7, for example. Mm. Um, and so he's, he's trying to oppose my bishop, but, um, yeah, I think it was one thing that I, I played actually Granda a few times starting with this game over the next few years. And, uh, one thing I noticed is that like, sometimes when he gets a bad position, he doesn't put up the most resistance. Like, uh, he sometimes I think gets a little frustrated maybe with himself and he's like, okay, like, um, he, he, he makes some moves. And in this case, like he walks into something even worse. Yeah. Like yeah. losing one pawn is not the worst compared to what happens. So <laughs> takes check. And now the Bishop is hanging. So go to f8 and then in comes rook takes c7 and it's game over yeah he can't do anything he can't do anything i mean his pieces on the queen side are pretty useless uh if rook e8 bishop g5 mm. um and it it just gets yeah he, ha he has no way out so um wow so that was he's a, a, he's in a tough spot. 20 move win against uh grand against a 26 30 player and i think that would have been a huge confidence boost for you at that point. No, for sure. Actually, I hadn't, um, I'd, I'd been some 2,600 players before, but never quite like this. Mm. Um, and this also felt like good in some ways because like I, you mentioned it earlier, some of my earlier games, uh, I mentioned like sharpening my style. I, 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 I studied some like Shirov and Morozevich games. And then I got like really enamored with, Hey, I can play chess like those guys. Um, this felt like a lot more controlled. Uh, it was like logical play of okay, he's abandoned the king side. I'll play knight e1, queen g4, and I can start an attack on the king side. So it it felt a little bit more in control. Wow. There's one more game that I wanted to look at, and this one yeah, sure. is your uh, loss against uh, Peter Bobras. Is there some story before this game? about what happened and yeah actually so um in 2008 i started playing chess full time so this was in 2009 and um late in 2008 uh 
me and actually a bunch of other chess friends, we decided to move into a house together. Wow. Um, and so this was uh, the GM house. Um, so with Jesse Cry, David Proust, they were in the house. And then Josh Friedel was like just two streets away. Um, so he would walk over most days. And, and um, all of you were trying to get to the GM title, yes? Actually, um, Josh, Jesse, and myself had already made Grandmaster. Hmm. Uh, David was working towards the GM title. And it was interesting because the three of us, Jesse, Josh, myself, we were the first. There had been other Grandmasters in the U.S. Um, in that time. So like Hikaru Nakamura, for example, uh, became a GM. Uh, Varujan Akobian became a GM. But the three of us all became a GM within, like, call it two, three months of each other. And it was kind of notable because we were the first three American born players to make Grandmaster in almost a, like basically a decade. Wow. Uh, for a long time, America had not like developed any homegrown. Uh, and like Hikaru, I think totally counts as like he came when he was two. Uh, but like from a technical standpoint of whether you're born in the US or born outside, like the three of us had all just become a Grandmasters. And we thought, hey, by studying together, we'll. We all get a lot better together. Um, and so we worked together for a few months. Uh, we were playing some tournaments and this was our first tournament abroad in France. Um, and yeah, I, I think this is, even though uh, it's it's a loss, it's actually like one of my favorite games that I've ever played. Um, so yeah, I think it's, it's a good one to go over. Let's, let's go over it. Uh, this is Capel La Grande tournament. You are white and... Bobras is is a strong GM twenty five fifty, uh, and he goes for the Grunfeld ninety four mm -hmm. line. Was it was it prepared during this, or you were sort of? I I was still in my preparation so far. Mm. Um, I hadn't. I I used to play this Bishop G five line. I basically avoided most main lines most of my chess career, especially with the white pieces. Sometimes with black, I would play more mainline openings, but um, this is one I had played. This this system was like my pet system for a little while. Okay. Um, but I, I started to improvise uh, in a few more moves. So now you you hit the b7 pawn. <laughs> yep. He goes b6 and knight g5. So so what's the idea of playing your queen to b1? Uh, I mean, it it is, you could directly go knight g5 as well, right? Uh, that's true. I think, th um, so like, part of the idea is that uh, pretend he plays, um, he moves his bishop away. Yeah. Uh, you can play e4 here. Uh, and then he plays h6. And so, okay, now there's two choices. If I move my knight anywhere, I lose the e4 pawn. Mm. And so instead of that, I have to take on d5. Uh, he takes on g5, and then he'll take back on the d5 pawn, right? Because he's hitting my bishop. Right. So the, the key point is that um, with the queen on b1, that e4 pawn is protected mm. when I do this, so I can move my knight again. Uh, um, so if he plays h6, I can move my knight, and I don't lose the e4 pawn, for example. Right. You decided to move your knight to h3. H yeah exactly and this uh this is already okay this is very rare at this point um I think most of the games in this line at that point were all my own <laughs> um so I had played this before but most people played knight f3 in which case the bishop can go back to e6 mm -hmm. here if he plays bishop e6 I play knight f4 and I again threaten to take the bishop and so he loses more time with his bishop got it so he went back to b7 yep and now you chop the pawn c5 hitting the center and knight f4 so now it's all uh, very tactical right because there's no way that you can hold on to your center you can't push this is hanging if i mean d4 is falling there is actually one idea here with queen b3 mm -hmm. um you can play queen b3 attacking f7 and then after black castles for example uh you play d5 Ah, yes. And this way you hold everything together. And um, I had played this before, actually. Uh, and I had, I'd, I'd, I think I was 2-0 and in this this line. Um, and I had played this before. I think this is probably a little bit better for white. Uh, but at the board, I had changed it up. Um, that ended up being 
well, it made it interesting, but it uh, may not have been the right idea. Well, you went knight f4. And and of course, one thing is that uh, he went g5 in the game. So we'll look at it. Yep. But if c takes d4, uh, you had a very strong idea up your sleeve here. Yeah, bishop takes f7 check. Uh, queen b King takes, queen b3 check. And now the black is in, you know, big trouble everywhere. So um, he can go back and then say knight e6, for example, is one option. Mm. Uh, and I'm forking the queen and bishop. Uh, if he goes back to f8, knight e6 wins the queen directly. Right. Um, so he's in he's in some trouble here. Yeah, this is lost. So he went g5. And now, I mean, a normal move would have been knight h5 here. Yeah. Go back this bishop. <laughs> But you you decided to sack a piece. Okay, this gets very exciting now. Takes queen b3. And and as we saw, if the king moves away anywhere, then knight e6 is just killing. Mm -hmm. So he played this move. Uh, was this... I mean, you would have calculated this, right? When you... uh, this, this much I had calculated, but... Um... When I played bishop f7, when I sacrificed the bishop, I didn't have, I didn't see all the like the next moves I played, but I did see up to this point. So he because um, bishop d5, he doesn't have much else to do, like right. you said. Takes and now, uh, if if he takes either of the pieces, let's say he takes on f4, mm -hmm. then you go d6. D6 exactly. So I I I open up the queen's diagonal, and now I'm going to take on e7 next. So like it's. He's up a piece, but it's actually, yeah, I think he's losing already at this point. Right. And if he takes on h4, still d6 is just killing. Similar idea. And now actually he has to worry about checkmate potentially in some lines too. So <laughs> Right. So he went queen d6, stopping the d pawn from advancing. And uh, this was a nice move by him. Yeah, actually, I think... Um, it, what was interesting about this game is like I, I've sacrificed some pieces, but it sometimes takes two players to like make a really, I think, like a brilliant game or enjoyable game. Like the last one, Granda didn't put up as much resistance, right? Right. Here, Bobras actually, for most of the game, he plays almost perfect mainline defense. I think even the latest version of Stockfish is like two thumbs up. So, wow. So you castle here. And now he has a choice between taking one of the pieces because now mm -hmm. now there's no problem here. So maybe taking here is possible. Definitely possible. Um, I'll I'll bring a rook to the e file. So like rook a one for example. Mm. Um, and he's got, the problem is he can never really take both pieces because I'll play d six check. Uh, and then I'll bring in a rook say to e seven. Um. He's got a lot of lot of troubles, I think, in these kinds of positions. Um, so it, it's it's interesting because like I sort of leave both pieces hanging for a long time because he always has this uh, problem of he needs to guard his e seven square right. and he needs to guard his e six square. Um, so it, there's never like an immediate checkmate, uh, but it's always sort of um, the the slow burn attack. Right, right. So here, uh, he didn't take either of the pieces. He went mm -hmm. knight d7. Yeah, again, Stockfish approves. So, yeah. And you also played a great move. It's uh, I guess what, what might be very interesting is the fact that you kept these two pieces as they are. You're like, I don't care about saving them at all. Because you can take no, only it... one. Uh, why should yeah. I even uh, care about it? He can only take one at a time, luckily. So um, if he could take two in one go, then I'd be in real trouble. But like, the, I, this is all about the initiative here. And like, I need to get my rooks on the e-file. I need to threaten sort of the e6, e7 squares. Um, and any way I can unlock, um, anytime he moves that queen on d6, I always have d6 check. Mm. And so like dislodging the queen is actually like a big theme for me in this attack. Right. And so he goes knight f8 stopping uh, any of your pieces from coming yep. to e6 you take pawn takes and then now you finally move your bishop so he must take the knight takes yep. and now you give up another piece just to get rid of <laughs> the blockader yep take d6 
and he goes e6. And now and you're this two is, pieces um, down. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, you're two pieces down. Yeah, two pieces down. I do have one idea here of queen b7 check because I can get that rook on a8, um, which is what I played. e6 actually is one of, I think, his two mistakes in the game. And it's, I mean, this is inhuman lines, but king g6 right. uh, turns out to be the correct move. Um, and it's like, there's only one way for like black to win this position. It's king g6, it's rook takes e7, or d takes e7 is playable too. Hmm. Um, but, but, then, uh, but then he moves his knight maybe to h7 or somewhere. Yep, else. yeah, exactly. So but if you play rook takes e7, now the idea is that I'm threatening queen b7 in some lines, hitting the rook on a8 and bishop on g7. Uh, maybe I can also bring another rook to e1, rook e3, rook g3. Mm. Uh, and you can see his knight on f8 is completely stuck, right? Right. Um, he can do that, but he can't come to f6, actually, because queen f7 will be strong. Right. Um, after knight h7, I'm throwing queen c2 check, too, right, Sometime, in some lines. So he's got some real problem. But the computer points out that actually after, instead of knight h7, uh, the only winning move there is h5. Um, Oops, sorry. So after, after king g6, h... Uh, yeah, h5. And like black is a little bit better here. Um, it's not like game over. But h5 uh, is his... for, for what? Like you don't even understand. King h6. Ah, getting the king here. And that's the only reason. <laughs> king h6 to get off the queen c2. You can maybe play for knight g6. Uh, it is still not like a... But you still you have know... this move. Which is like still have idea. ideas, yeah, yeah. So it's not the game's not over. Um, it's just, uh, I mean, h five is like I don't know if you, if you can find that move at the board. I think, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't even think like some top ten player would be able to do that. It's it's a very tough move. Yes, I it's it doesn't look like it. I think yeah, your level of thinking has to be like really far advanced. Yes. yes. Or it's almost like a random move generator. So, <laughs> so so e six seemed more human here. Yeah. Uh, check king here. You took the rook, bishop c three, and he's getting back some of his material now. Uh, exactly. And here you played rook e four, attacking the queen. Yep. And actually, um, I missed something here with rook e three is actually a little bit stronger, uh, but I. Um, I didn't calculate this correctly to the end. So he can take my rook and then I, uh, yep. Um, I, I can actually start with queen e8 check, I think is probably a little bit stronger. Uh, so the point is if he blocks with the queen, then I play rook g3 check but, and but I'll get the queen. go back here, right? Uh, let's see. Because the bishop comes back, so. Ah, yeah, yeah. Okay, sorry. Okay, so maybe rook g3 check, sorry, first mm. is correct. Um, and if he goes back now, I can play queen b7 or queen a7. Yes. Uh, and there's checkmate coming. Um, so he has to go forward, I think, to h5. Mm -hmm. um, because if he goes to f6, I play rook f3 as well, pinning the queen. And this is very good for you, yeah. This is, yeah, I mean, his coordination is really bad. He actually has some good material, but it's his pieces aren't developed at all. It's it's tough. I still have my d-pawn too, right? So I can... Right. Um, so if he plays king h5, then I play queen e8 check, king h4. And I, I did see this much during the game, mm. but I couldn't figure out what to do next. Um, and I was looking at moves like h3, f3, uh, but none of those moves actually win. Mm. Um, and there's a much simpler win here, rook h3 check, uh, king g5, queen h5 check, king f6, rook f3. Right. Um, and it's a very, very like elegant win. Again, I get to the same kind of material mm. balance. Uh, but this is where e6 was officially a mistake because even though this line looks good at first, he's in some trouble here. So um, Beautiful. very nice. But line. I, I wasn't able to calculate this correctly to the end. So right, not easy to give your entire rook up, uh, rook there, no, and yeah. plus the attack. So rookie four. Rook I, I think at this point rookie. it's already like also. You're you're thinking for a while, and so like I'd spent plenty of time earlier. Um, so I saw I could attack the queen. All right, attack the queen, then save the other rook. Right. You went queen f five, and you brought your rook, but you didn't save the other rook. <laughs> I didn't save the other rook. Now this this was such a big surprise to me during the game when he took the rook. 
what was it an oversight total oversight oh um God. it because, was because you could you but playing where do you play your rook like d1 maybe rook d1 is possible because yeah. the queen on a guards the rook on e4 mm. um so this is still playable i think white can also play actually g4 i think in some lines mm. um gain another tempo basically against the queen uh before bringing the rook out but rookie one was a complete oversight oh i uh <laughs> it was when he took the rook actually like uh i was it took me a few minutes just to like understand what had happened um because i i've i my my play up to this point has been actually really really good yes um even the computer thinks white has great compensation in a lot of places uh, but rookie one, there's no justification for it's just it's just a bad move. So, <laughs> and uh, what what I like is that even though you made this move, this is one of your games which is memorable, which also shows that you are like you like chess in general, and uh, I mean not just about your it's not only about your wins. No, I I mean I think I I really enjoy like the like trying to create something interesting at the board. Um, and for me, this was like one of my biggest creative achievements. Like I sacrificed the piece in the opening. I left the two pieces hanging for a long time. Uh, this game is still actually not over yet. Like I have, um, at the moment, I only have one pawn for the night, but his coordination is really poor. Right. Um, for me, this game was like, uh, I I mean, I didn't have a great tournament in Capella Grand, uh, but like I had, I certainly had wins in the tournament. Um, but for me, this was like, when I was actually putting together a game list of like best games to put in the book, this one was definitely there. There are a couple other losses that are in there that are like, um, yeah, they're some of my favorite games that I've ever played. Wow. So Rook D7, Rook E4, you're still trying to attack. Uh, but he blocks well, I'm also down a piece, so like, <laughs> I don't have much choice. <laughs> G4, he goes back there. And now queen c6. King get seven. Rook c4 takes. It doesn't seem like that attack is going to like work out here. Yeah. No. <laughs> uh, like... The attack is basically no more. But um, the I, the key thing is I can get the c5 pawn, mm. uh, and that's useful. Um, so now I have two pawns for the piece and, and some ideas here. Exactly, yeah, and and like rook and knight are not like uh rook and knight versus rook is a drawn end game, right? So like it's um it's not like rook and bishop sometimes where you have to be a lot more careful defending. Rook and knight is usually pretty easy to hold. Right. Did you uh, did you miss a chance here that in this I one? definitely did. Um, and this one, uh, I mean, I was getting a little bit low on the clock, but I actually had time. Mm. But it's um you know how I mentioned earlier that sometimes like strong players they see they look at fewer moves and here i think i rejected a move uh too quickly so i saw i could take on d7 i could sacrifice my queen right. it's only a temporary sacrifice queen takes queen rook c7 knight f8 um and i saw that okay like i can trade all the pieces this way but i assumed this end game was going to be losing for me because his king is close to the d6 pawn my pawns aren't going to queen uh, but I mean, it, it took me just a few minutes after the game to realize actually like white can draw this end game. So wow. you start with like moves like H4, uh, you don't have to take the queen right away. The king moves away. Rook takes queen, knight takes rook. Uh, and now it's, you play H5 check. And, um, so King G5, you can start bringing your king forward. He, he can, he can never take because of. H6. Exactly. If he does this, then uh, the knight can't guard both pawns at the same time. Exactly. Yep. Right. Um, and I I queen one pawn. And uh alternatively, he can instead of king g5, he can go king f6 and he can go after the d6 pawn. Mm. Uh, but in this case, again, I can uh I'm just fast enough to distract him with moves like h6, uh bringing the king up. Um, and yeah, I I can just draw this end game actually i wow. uh, it, it it didn't take me too long afterwards to realize i missed this but at the board uh maybe i was a little bit tired maybe i was also a little like i i i didn't quite believe that i could draw this end game mm. 
Right. But also a nice uh, reminder that it's never over. Yes. Uh... Never <laughs> over. No, no, no. And like, I think I, I mentioned he made two mistakes in the game. One was this very human move of E6 uh, with the follow up Bishop takes C3 because he's going to get his material back. Um, and his second mistake here was actually instead of bringing his knight to G6, he should have left it there and he could have reorganized his pieces a little bit differently. He he just can't bring his knight out from F8 so quickly right away. Right. Um, because he he opens himself up to some of these ideas, but uh, that was his second mistake. But otherwise, I mean, he played a really good game. Um, and at this point now, it becomes much harder for me to like I this I can't save now. I've lost one pawn, and he really is truly up a piece. So, and now you're losing d6, so you resign. Yeah. So very resign. nice, yep. very cool, uh, uh, Vinay. I mean, it was. Very nice to see two games with you. Very exciting. Also shows your style of play, uh, which is actually very, uh, very interesting. It's a you have a wide range. You can attack. You can play positionally, and I think the games cover that, uh, which is also yeah. I think my games as a kid were you know more one style, but then uh, like you mentioned, chess for pythons. It was meant to be more all strategic wins, almost no tactics anywhere. Um, but then there are games like this one where I'm sacrificing pieces left and right. So, right. Um, yep. Wonderful. Well, before we sign off, uh, this I, I see your backdrop here. Uh, oh, sure. Something very yeah. interesting. That I think there's a frame uh, with... Uh, is is that Vishy Anand on the right? Or yeah, that's that? Anand, actually. It's funny because... Um, so he was here in... Uh, he was here visiting the Bay Area a few years ago. I'd met him before. Um, but he was at Google. Um, most everyone else in this photo is a relative of some kind. Right. So it's like my nephew, my niece, my parents, uh, some of my cousins. This was in uh, Le Pakshi, mm. um, uh, near Bangalore, uh, near Hyderabad. Um, but uh, yeah, Anand is not a relative, but some somebody was joking. He was like, oh man, like uh, you have all your family photos and then you have... Anand. So he's yeah. your chess idol, yes. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. I think actually once I um I when I first started playing, I didn't know about him, but call it by the mid nineties. Uh he played the world championship with Kasparov. Um and basically then uh anything anything he's published, I'll buy. Anything he's played, like I'll look at. So yeah. Well, yes, of course. I mean, everyone loves him. Uh, and uh, very nice to see that picture. And also, there, yeah, there are a lot of books. I don't believe these are chess books in the backdrop. None are chess books, actually. Yeah. Is there is there any favorite book of yours from there which you would like to recommend to Ooh, people? Um, which is are there are a bunch of a uh, bunch of books here. I would say uh, so. Um, you probably uh, Satya Jit Ray, the Faluda stories. Oh. Um, so actually, uh, at that tournament in Delhi in 2009, um, I think it might have been, uh, maybe it was Saptarshi Roy. Mm. Uh, we went to a bookstore. Um, I, I think like him, me, Magesh, uh, we went to a bookstore and I, I picked these up actually, I think in Delhi at the time. Wow. Um, those are great stories. Uh, I tend to read a lot of literature even now. So, um, but there's, uh, Let's see. I think my favorite author is an American author named Raymond Chandler. Um, and so I have some of his books behind me. Um, it's a it's a like wide variety of things. So there's some technical books, uh, some data science books. There's some other stuff. Um, yeah. Well, from, from being a reader, now you are now an author and people can read <laughs> your books uh, and have them in their library. I think uh, when I, this is a work that has come from your heart i think it's your life story and and i'm sure that people are going to learn a lot out of it so thank you so much for sharing your experiences here no thank you um it's been a pleasure um yeah i love talking to you and thanks for having me thank you